many of the pieces, the component pieces that comprise neurotechnology have existed in various forms for many years. Brainwave biofeedback has been around since the 1960s and flickering light stimulation uh, has certainly been utilized as a means for altering consciousness for the last several hundred thousand years. Dreams have had a profound impact on individuals and in fact on the course of human history Yet until this century, they were hardly considered a worthy subject for a serious study, let alone as doorways to our deeper selves. Meditation has been employed by many cultures as a tool for self-knowledge and self-mastery. Yet our Western culture often seems not to place a premium on such self-knowledge. Uh, we're concerned as we are with the acquisition and control of things. Perhaps most importantly, most of us do not have the time to reflect deeply, uh, nor does our education provide us with a context within which we can value self-awareness. The 1960s witnessed a renaissance of interest in self-knowledge, springing largely from the psychedelic movement. The psychedelic experience catapults the user into layers of consciousness hardly imaginable prior to that experience. But that experience was rather like being shot from a cannon uh, you see a lot of scenery quickly, but you're not in the best frame of mind to sort the experience out. What the psychedelics did in many cases was to catalyze an interest in the content of consciousness and awareness of the extent of those unplumbed depths. The, the strong resurgence of interest in Eastern religion and especially meditation techniques uh, sprung in part from this interest. A rather extensive body of research uh, demonstrated that meditation altered brainwave activity dramatically, especially in the alpha band. Interest in brainwave biofeedback uh, then centered about increased alpha activity and eventually to the correlation of patterns of brainwave activity with specific states of consciousness. Interest in the development and expansion of consciousness waned in the years since the early 1970s in part due to the popular association of these techniques with the drug culture. By the 1980s, it seemed that the majority of personal development time was being spent on working out the body with relatively little attention being spent on uh, enhancing consciousness. In the meantime, however, a number of uh, small groups were working a way to develop new, improved tools uh, for the exploration and enhancement of consciousness and for the development of optimal mental states. Devices with names like the Mind Mirror, Dreamlight, and Voyager have appeared on the scene, each operating in very different ways to aid in the development of consciousness. These then were the emerging new forms of neurotechnology, the capabilities of most of which were boosted by powerful microprocessors. As these technologies evolve and mature, connections will naturally form between them, like intertwining roots in the forest. The reason then that I'm hosting this conference is to help fertilize the soil to provide you with a snapshot of the early growth stages of the f this new field and provide some hints of the kinds of tools and techniques which we may eventually find packaged together in a neat box in every home and school. We're going to start out today uh, with uh, Stephen LaBerge. I made my notes in large print here since I'm not used to doing this sort of thing. Okay, Stephen LeBurge. Uh, Dr. LeBurge received his undergraduate degree in mathematics from the University of Arizona in two years. And by 1968, had completed graduate coursework at Stanford in chemical physics. Following a stint as a research chemist and consultant, he returned to Stanford uh, to receive his PhD in uh, psychophysiology in 1980. In addition to his ongoing research positions at Stanford, he served as adjunct professor at California Institute of Integral Studies and lecturer at the Center for Interdisciplinary Science in San Francisco. In 1987, he founded the Lucidity Institute in Palo Alto for the study of lucid dreaming. He's the author of more than 30 articles and two best-selling books about lucid dreaming and is co-editor of a scholarly anthology on the subject. Dr. LeBerge is considered by many to be the world's foremost expert on the subject of lucid dreaming. Please join me in welcoming Stephen LeBerge. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Good morning. Well, we should start off, uh, we heard, uh, I'm going to talk about lucid dreaming. What is that? Some of you uh, will be unfamiliar with the term. It refers simply to dreams in which you know that you're dreaming while you're having them. So while you're in a dream, you say to yourself, somehow, this has got to be a dream. It might happen because of some fantastic element. Uh, let's say uh, the speaker in front of you started to float into the air. Uh, and you say, what's going on? Is this the latest in neurotechnology? Or <laughs> is it a dream? And most likely, the explanation would be the dream. We're not at that level of neurotechnology in this room, as far as I know yet. So uh, you can then, the experience uh, is like what you're experiencing right now in terms of vividness and reality. It seems as real as this is, except for you know that it's all in your mind. Now, it may be that this is all in your mind, too, but that's another topic entirely. Now, uh, how many people have had the experience of lucid dreaming? So most of you have, yes. Uh, how many people have the experience um, more than once a week? That's right. And uh, that's what we find uh, in audiences everywhere, that most people know what a lucid dream is from experience. It's something they've had rarely, occasionally, it seems accidentally or by grace of God. But um, it's very few people that has it frequently. And one part of our research has been aimed at trying to enhance people's capacity for having lucid dreams. Now, I, I'd like to uh, start out, though, with uh, giving people a sense of why would you like to cultivate a capacity to have lucid dreams more frequently? Why not just let them be that they are occasional, rare, and perhaps gratifying experiences? Why have more of them? Uh, there is one answer, a short answer to that is freedom, it's that uh, right now, we are, in the state that we're in now, we are constrained by many laws that limit what we can do, for example. Uh, I'll make my standard offer. Anyone that uh, prefers to float to the ceiling instead of sitting in chairs, please do so. And likewise, anyone that would like, uh, at any time during the day, can step right up here and do a funny little dance, just for fun. Now. For some reason, no one ever takes me up on these suggestions. And uh, you can see why. Well, first of all, why don't you fly? There we say something called gravity, the laws of physics. Okay. Now, in the dream, suppose this were a dream, and this dream character said the same thing to you. And you'd be sitting there thinking, I can't fly. And what would be keeping you in your seats, then, is not some external law of physics, no law of gravity. What it would be would be your mental barrier, the idea that you can't fly, a convention, an expectation. It's the moment you realize that that's no longer appropriate because you are, in fact, dreaming, you can step into the air and float. Likewise, why doesn't anyone come up here and do something silly? Well, what will people think? So we're concerned about the social laws. There are many constraints in our behavior that have to do with the laws of society. And that's generally good, but it does constrain our behavior. And so there are things that you can't do right now because of fear of social consequences and because of the social agreements you've entered into. And if you were dreaming, you would be thinking, what would people think? But if you knew you were dreaming now, you would realize that there's no one else there, that it doesn't matter what somebody else thinks, doesn't matter what your neighbors think, it matters what you think. If whatever you want to do in your dream is something that you're fully at peace with and consistent and in harmony with, then do it. And you can see the difference in the amount of freedom that you would have in the case where you have uh, no laws of physics, no laws of society in the dream state. But that's only the potential freedom of the dream state, which can only be actualized if you know what you're doing at the time. Otherwise, <coughs> excuse me, you would uh, simply uh, dream away your opportunities for a wider life in that state. Now, there, there's another way of formulating the value of it also, and that is in terms of the difference between conscious and unconscious behavior. Much of our behavior is unconscious. It's habitual, that's to say, learn from past experiences and we apply it to uh, new experiences in which it seems to apply. So I don't have to think about how I talk. I know how to talk, and it works automatically. I don't have to, looks like I don't get the move here. 
All right, maybe I do. Um, I don't have to think about much of my behavior. It, it happens automatically, and that's of advantage as long as I'm in a situation in which where I am now is enough like where I was in the past that I can use a behavior that I learned that worked for there. But when I get into a new situation where things are different enough, then I have to be conscious about what it is I'm doing. And this conscious action then gives me more flexibility. You um, could all have experienced the, the difference uh, in the, the common occurrence of, of driving to work, for example. You're driving to work, and then you realize it's actually Saturday and you wanted to go somewhere else, but you were captured by that path, the usual way that you drive, and you suddenly come to oh, this is not where I want to be going. That's being reflectively conscious now. And it allows you to see whether your current actions are in accordance with your actual goals. So it can correct when you're, you know you're going wrong somehow. How do you correct that? So it's an error correcting device. It's very simple to demonstrate the difference also in the qualities of, of the conscious and unconscious action by a, a, a simple action. You can all put your hands together like this. Let, let, let's. So make a fist like this, please, everybody. All right. Now, uh, when you've got it, the hands together, then on top, one of, presumably one of your two thumbs will be on top. Then take it, hands apart, and then put them back together with the other thumb on top. Now, now notice the difference in feel. Now you can, amen. So <laughs> you. you now, the point of that is the first way you did it was a habit. You had learned how to do that action, and it and worked smoothly and in a way that was simple. You didn't have to think about it. It felt right. The other way felt a bit awkward, probably because you'd never done it before. You were applying consciousness to direct your action in that case. That lets you do something that was more flexible than the habit. So if you want flexibility, creativity, freedom, then you need consciousness. The same thing applies to the waking state and the dream state. So in the dream state, people can use lucid dreaming for a self-development process, a process of facing their fears, uh, overcoming the inner difficulties and disharmonies, finding out what's inside me, what am I like. That's a kind of experiential workshop or playground to try out new behaviors a sort of real virtual reality using the best technology that we've got. OK? Well, given the limits of time, I don't think I can go much more into the applications of lucid dreaming. But uh, to, just to mention one final one, uh, I was on in the Laura Lee show uh, last Saturday night. And uh, the last caller of the night uh, asked me a question. He said, you know, um, I wake up from these lucid dreams, and, and I feel ecstatic. I is, is that unusual? And the answer is no, it's not unusual. That people find lucid dreaming, in some cases, thrilling, an experience of, of realizing the power and freedom of the mind, of saying that this is all in my mind. And where common sense view says that that's the world that you see out there, and that's where all the complexity and wonder is, and there's nothing, the mind is just a mirror or something, or a window that you look through. But but the complexity is as much in us and the creative power, likewise. So now I'm going to describe to you the, some of the technology that we've developed. And uh, but to do that, we have to go back to the beginning of the research. Could you have the slides on, please? Now, the, the challenge, uh, lights on the other side of the room perhaps would help. The challenge is uh, I had had lucid dreams. I knew that it was possible, just as all of you who have had it um, know that lucid dreaming really happens. But uh, the scientists at the time, and this may be a theme you'll be hearing today, didn't believe it was possible. And I wanted to find out, well, how could I prove that I really was having these experiences? How does the lion know what's going on in the mind of the sleeping gypsy? The gypsy is having a dream. How can we find out what's going on there? Genetic systems. I'd like to welcome you to the Neurotechnology Forum. And thank you all for being here.